and um, I'm Elaine Trigiani, and I have been uh, living here in Italy for about 20 years, working in food and wine um, education and tourism. And before that, I was an art historian at the National Gallery of Art. So since COVID hit, I have been um, doing kind of what we call virtual visits. Um, so today we are gonna make a virtual visit to Verona. Let me get my screen set here. One second. Takes me a second. Um, Lorenzo, this is very difficult. I put in my. Oh, much easier. Bianca. No, but I. No. Okay, va bene. Okay, so we're going to go to Verona. You can see Verona there, the pink dot at the top um, and upper, kind of the northern part of, of Italy. And you can see it's between Milan and Venice. It's actually in the um, region of Veneto, the capital of which is Venice. And it's in the Po River Valley, right there at the base of those mountains. Um, my house is here, so I'm coming to you from right there. And this little circled area here um, is, I'm going to show you because we're going to use truffles tonight, and that's a truffle area that's literally practically in my backyard, lucky for me. Um, so in Italy, truffles are found in the Nebrodi Mountains down here. They're found in Irpinia here, Umbria, Piemonte, and then this area, which is generally San Miniato is kind of the capital of the, the truffle area here. Um, which is right close to where I live. So I'll show you what that looks like. So here it is. Here we go. So I live here on the estate of the castle at Popiano. My landlords, of course, live in the castle. I live um, in a little farmhouse below there, but this is what the hills look like. And the truffle area is just kind of that way off to the right here in this kind of landscape picture, rolling hills. And then it gets kind of foresty and walking through the forest, we get all sorts of good truffles. Here's a view of my house. There's a little snowfall today. So my house is right here. This is a view looking down from the castle tower. That's my house, my chimney. And then um, you can see my front door there. With, we have like little teensy weensy little icicles. I know that doesn't look like much to y'all who are, you know, all you guys who are up in Michigan and Wisconsin. I don't know. For us, it was a lot. The kids were out kind of fluffing around in it. All right, so we're going to go to Verona, which is this lovely sparkly town kind of nestled in this bend of the river Adige, the base of Monte San Pietro. It's quite lovely. It has a very amazing long history and um, it was a center of power during the Roman Empire. So the Romans came up here in the third century BC. Rome was founded in 753 BC. By the third century BC, they decided they needed to take over Verona because um, they wanted it for trade reasons and also kind of for defensive purposes. And Verona today actually has um, kind of one of the largest um, kind of collections of um, extant Roman buildings in northern Italy. So when you're walking through Verona, you get stuff like this. These are the literally the gates in the Roman wall around town. You can see how they had bastions. Um, and there's still either parts of the fabric of the city, like Porta Leone you see on the left, or um, Porta Borsari, which you see on the right. It's literally, that was the main gate into the um, city of Verona, and it's still used. You enter the historic city of town through this, you know, gorgeous um, Roman porta. There are things like the Arch of the Davi family, first century AD. There's a small uh, theater you can see here looking out over the river, and then there's that lovely bridge, which is called the Pons Pietra, the stone bridge, which of course, the fact that before that it was a wooden bridge. Um, this is all from sort of right around sort of first century BC, first century AD. And then the most stunning of all of these um, kind of extant Roman structures is the arena, the Roman amphitheater, which is literally right in the center of town. I and mean, it's kind of shocking that, you know, you're just walking around town and there it is. It's kind of um, uh, this beautiful reminder of the great past of Verona. It's still used for concerts today. There's a great, um, it's very well known for their opera season. And you can see there, the picture on the left there, the arena is outfitted for um, an opera performance. So can you imagine just sort of walking through sparkly Verona up the red carpet to go inside of this Roman um, amphitheater to watch your opera performance? It was built in um, 24 to 30 AD. It held, um, 30,000 spectators. It's lost its outer ring. That happened in Rome as well. This is one of the biggest, by the way, one of the biggest um, of um, the amphitheaters that exist from the ancient world, second only to 
um, the Colosseum in Rome and the amphitheater in Capua. But as happened in Rome, much of this outer layer um, is no longer present. A lot of it was used, literally reused for um, building other buildings, which sounds shocking, but they used to do that. This thing is huge. It's, an, it's elliptical, so you can see this is the long axis. It's one and a half football fields. And again, it's just plopped right here in the center of the city. So the Roman town looked like this. So when the arena was first built here, it's, you can see it's right outside of the city wall. And this is a very typical Roman town. There is a Decumanus Maximus, Cardo Mayor, these two big cross streets, the forum in the middle, and then smaller kind of city blocks filling in um, the rest of the space of the, um, with, there within the walls. So the urban fabric of Verona today, still, I mean, the imprint of the um, Roman grid structure is still there. So this is how the town grew. Um, the next set of walls that went in after the Roman step, there was this one, which is a later Roman wall. And then the Scaliera family in the medieval period when um, Verona was a free comune, an autonomous comune, the Scaliera family were the signori who were sort of in charge. And they put in this set of walls that if you look really carefully at that slide on the right, still follow, you know, the outline of the city follows those walls. It's, you know, literally follows the walls that the Scaliere family put in. So the way um, that the city is located there in the bend of the river, and then with those just imposing defensive walls, it has worked to really keep out, um, you know, a lot of the more sort of, you know, industrial buildings and structures of contemporary life that a lot of times invade a city center. In the case of Verona, they don't invade the city center. You know, the, the train station doesn't come right into the middle of the town. Here's the train station out here. Here's an industrial complex over here. So that's really helped to keep the center of the town very authentic. And add to that the fact that um, the Veronese have had kind of a penchant for historical preservation. And in fact, in the 1400s, there was a, there's a law on the books that um, was kind of the first um, move for towards historical preservation in Verona. And there were large fans in place for people who were trying to take stones away from the arena, for example. You couldn't do that. You know, they, they actually closed it with, the, they closed the arena with a key. And if you needed the key, then go tell the gatekeeper that he'll let you in. No dumping, no dumping at the arena, and you cannot take stones away, nor can you throw things at the building to make stones fall off the building. Like that, all of this was off limits. Clearly, everybody was doing this, and so they put the stop to that, and literally preserved the center of their city so much so that today, when you go visit there, it's very evocative. It's a very authentic experience. The Roman urban plan is evident. You can still see gates and bastions from the Roman area, like such as here. Um, and there are all sorts of works of art and architecture from Roman days, medieval period, Renaissance. Um, the house you see there on the upper left is a later structure that is actually so-called House of Juliet, as in Romeo and Juliet. So Romeo and Juliet was um, uh, set here in Verona. A couple people actually think Shakespeare was born in Sicily. I think that's just kind of funny, they'll, 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 you know, argue their case, but most scholars agree that Shakespeare never set foot in Italy, but he seems to have known Italian history, current events, he certainly knew Italians in England, there were diplomats, um, there were um, businessmen there from Italy, and he seems to have been enamored of Italy, he set eight plays in Italy, so that's kind of nice, and then the idea that everybody wants to go see this house, which they pretend is Juliet's house, is frankly beyond me, and even that balcony that you see there, just so you know, was built in about 1960. Okay, so this house didn't even have a balcony on it. Anyway, whatever. I am not going to take you to see Juliet's house. I'm going to take you to the San Zeno neighborhood. So San Zeno is um, now, it's now called the neighborhood of San Zeno here. There was a Benedictine monastery here um, from which came Zeno, who became a saint. And I'm going to tell you all, all about him. It's right here. And so here's this neighborhood is called the Quartiere San Zeno. So here we go. This is the church of San Zeno as it stands today. So Zeno was a priest from North Africa, the dark skinned Roman citizen. And he came here to be a monk and joined the Benedictine monastery. So there was a nice big Benedictine complex here. What remains today is that tower with those ghibelline turrets that you see there on the left. So Zeno was much loved by the citizens of Verona. He was a very humble man. He was known for living a life of uh, poverty 
he became Bishop of Verona um, at the end of his life. He was Bishop from 362 to 372 AD. He died in 372 AD, and then a church immediately was built here on top of his tomb. So this church is on the top of the tomb of St. Zeno. So he was known for going fishing in the IDJ River, for example. He liked to catch fish for his lunch. He gave, uh, he gave you know, fish away to the poor people to help them, um, you know, just kind of food to folks who needed it. He was also, lots of miracles were attributed to San Zeno. He, for example, you know, if there was a demon who was trying to sink a carriage in the, the river, you know, he would miraculously save them. He saved lots of people from drowning. Um, other miracles were attributed to him. So he is now known, first of all, he was made a saint, and he's known as the patron saint of freshwater fishermen. So all you fishermen out there, he's the man for you. Um, so he seems to have been this very lovable guy. Um, again, they built this church. Um, literally, there's been a church on this site from the late 300s AD. What you're looking at is actually kind of a pastiche. It's a little bit of a mystery. And I kind of went down the rabbit hole reading about medieval sculpture because if you look at this church, there's just something that's not quite right about it. And so the, the story goes that this church was built in the year 1138 after a great earthquake. There's This area is subject to earthquakes and it's also subject to great flooding from the IDJ River. The river's right there. So the deal is that this building was built in 1138. We have some documents to that effect. And then that great rose window was supposedly put in in the year 1200. Um, and we also know that the, the artist who worked on the facade did this portico, which is called a pro tiro and all of these sculptures. We have documents. Um, placing Niccolo here, Maestro Niccolo. This is from this very early medieval period. It's um, the year 1138. People don't have last names yet, okay? So he's known as Niccolo, and he is Maestro Niccolo. He's a very well-known sculptor. We know that he was here. There are documents that tell us that. His name is even, I'll show it to you in a minute, right about here. He signed it. So we do know he was here, but it just doesn't quite work out because, frankly, he was better than this. Um, this is just kind of odd looking. From a distance, it doesn't look so bad. When you get close up, it just doesn't hang together so well. So turns out what we think happened is that um, this is literally the sixth or seventh building that was built on this site. So evidence tends to point to a complete rebuilding with that big rose window. And what's giving us all of the clues mostly are this pro tiro, that little portico thing which like I said, just kind of doesn't look like something that Niccolo did because we know other buildings that Niccolo uh, designed. And so Niccolo, when he makes a pro tiro, he does it like this. And this is another church in Verona. It's actually the Duomo, the mother church of Verona. And so here's the pro tiro here. You can see that there on the right. So notice how it's quite elaborate. It's two story that actually makes it work like an outdoor pulpit. It's um, nicely articulated. It's very much in harmony both with itself and with the facade as a whole and it opens up really nicely to kind of lead you in specifically with this series of ribs that kind of um they almost are set on a diagonal and they bring you into the building and Niccolo is kind of famous for being the person who put together the little porch with those ribs and he did it here in Verona and he did it again in Ferrara. So this is quite a different building, but if you just look at that pro tiro, that it's basically the same idea. This is a little bit more elaborate. The two-story pro tiro, it's well articulated, it's perfectly proportioned both to itself and to the building. And it's got those, um, the, the, the ribs that are kind of bringing you into, the, kind of creating this dramatic entry into the church. And then if you go back to the church of San Zeno Maggiore, again, it's just kind of this weird little thing stuck on the front of the church. So what we're pretty sure that, hap that happened here is that in the year 1200, for whatever reason, they enlarged the church. They totally rebuilt the facade. And whoever did it, I don't think, I mean, again, from a distance, it doesn't look bad. But from close up, it just kind of doesn't really hold water. I don't think this guy, I don't know who he, we don't know who he was. Um, but this maybe wasn't his most successful design. But he was sensible. He had the sensitivity enough in any event to recover all the good sculpture that was on site. So we have, we know um, that Niccolo was here and we have his sculpture. It's just in a different place from where he put it, but we can still see what he did today. So let's take a look at the work that Niccolo did here on the, um, for the Church of San Zeno Maggiore. And the first thing we're gonna look at is the lunette um, under the pro tiro and above the door. So this is the first thing you look at 
Um, you know, if you're walking into the church, that's it. You can't, even if you're trying not to look, you can't help but see this. And it's this really interesting mix of secular subject matter and religious subject matter. So in the middle, there's Zeno, who's, um, you know, he's squishing the demon. That's what he's known for. He's squishing the demon. There's this red kind of demon, I mean, excuse me, black demon under his feet. And then he's surrounded on either side by basically all of the citizenry of Verona. And he's got the common men on one side and then the condottieri signori on their horses on the other side. So it's kind of a reminder that in this period, churches were not only used as places of worship. They were, they had major civic significance. They were used as archives. They were, they served as record offices. Um, they were a visual expression of civic pride. In this instance, they're actually commemorating this moment when Verona was you know, judiciously given, um, judicially, excuse me, status of free commune. So they're really, they're showing the popolo and the signori over here on either side of San Zeno. So the church had quite a different function um, then than it did today. And then just notice all of the lovely um, decorative details. This little man here is literally holding on his head this basket from which springs this entire kind of, you know, arch full of wonderful decorative details, with, you know, sort of leaping stags and whatnot. Um, it's also polychrome, so it's been painted, and that's the original color. Um, the building itself is quite colorful. Go back here really quickly. They use local stone, so white, uh, travertine, and the local marble, which is red. So a lot of what you'll see um, in the stonework here is actually red. And they use that stripe uh, motif, which y'all may have seen before in Siena or Orvieto or Pisa. Um, it's usually either green and white or black and white in those areas, but that's just because that's what they quarry there. So here, of course, it's red. So here's another view of the Protirum um, with those great lions carved out of the red stone, little slender columns. And then these jams um, have the months of the year carved on them. So little allegories of the months of the year. And a lot of times these are even accompanied by zodiac symbols. In this case, we don't have any zodiac. They may have been lost. But um, the idea is, you know, this is sort of a couple hundred years before clocks were even invented. So the idea of the passage of time, kind of the rhythm of the seasons and everyday activities um, were often placed on the entryway into a Romanesque church. We also saw that in Arezzo, if y'all remember a couple months ago when we looked at the Pieve di Santa Maria um, in Arezzo. Um, the, months of, the months of the year in that case were carved here, if y'all recall. So here we have the months of the year. So the people who are coming into the church are kind of being reminded of the passage of time, um, which of course has larger significance once you sit down and start meditating on that in the church. Um, and they would have very, uh, they would have really identified with the um, kind of the scenes that are depicted here under these arches. And I'm gonna show you this, those three. So here we are looking at the months of September, October, and November. First of all, they're all um, set off and um, divided by those great kind of squat columns, each of one of which is different with their um, capitals. And then that great, uh, very round hemispherical arch, it's called an arco a tutto sesto. And when we, when we say that, we're literally pointing out the fact that it's not it doesn't look like this, which means it's not Gothic, it's Romanesque, it looks like this. So that's what we're dealing with here. And each scene is divided by a couple of little towers and castles and things. And then within that are just the daily activities that go on during those months. So in September, and these are the works of Niccolo, and look at how just beautifully he's handled naturalistic details, composition. Um, September is the month when you pick grapes off this gorgeous grapevine with its woody um, you know, the woody vine and the beautiful leaves. And grapes, you can literally see each one, you just pluck a grape off of there, get put into the lovely woven basket, and then, of course, put into a um, wine barrel with staves and squish with your feet, and off you go, you're going to ferment your wine. Um, next month is October, and this man, I believe what he's doing, I actually believe that he is making sure that the wild pigs have enough to eat. That's what I think he's doing here. And this is a gorgeous composition. This huge oak tree separates the composition and divides it in half. And it's not at all, it's very well proportioned, but it's not realistically proportioned. Look at that gorgeous um, 
woven kind of braided trunk of the tree and the enormous oak leaves they're gorgeous oak leaves i mean one leaf is as big as that guy's arm the point there was not to be realistic the point was to show you that this guy's banging an oak tree and what he's doing is making these super cute little acorns fall off onto the ground so those pigs eat them and the reason he's doing that is because the next month november he's going to make some salami and you can see that's what he's doing so you know everybody i mean we're you know we still know about that right i mean our grandfathers and great grandfathers were killing a hog in the fall and then you get that way you had you know salami and prosciutto to eat all year so this building the the parts done by Niccolo are just covered with sculpture everywhere so even look at the um, this part of this there's under here look there's even something under here i can't tell what it is it's driving me crazy and i wish i could have gone to verona to prepare for this um class tonight and i can't go because of covid and it's been impossible so i'm going on memory and what people tell me and a good friend of mine turns out it's from verona and she gave me a lot of info so um that's nice so now let's take a look at these sculptures here they're relief panels and again they're just a little bit incongruous they're gorgeous they're actually signed by niccolo we know that but what are they doing here they just look weird and they're also out of order like they're just yeah, once you once you realize that, like, well, this is not where they were originally installed. It just is impossible. So we believe they were originally installed on the interior of the church, perhaps, for example, on the rood screen, that object that actually separates the apse from the nave. We're not sure, um, but most likely, when smart when he designed these and installed them, they were probably in order of some sort. Now they're totally out of order. Um, they are, though. We have. New Testament scenes over here, which are actually signed by a guy, a guy called Guglielmo, who was in the workshop of Niccolo. And then these scenes, which are Old Testament scenes, um, done, sculpted by and signed by Niccolo. And I'll just show you a couple of those. So here we go. Remember Niccolo with his love of naturalistic details and whatnot. So these are Genesis scenes, and you can see Christ, uh, excuse me, God creating the animals, animals of the earth, animals of the sky. God creating Adam and then God creating Eve. So what's really cool here is again, all of these naturalistic details. I mean, look at the birds, you know, every kind of bird that this guy had ever seen is represented here, including this old duck right here, who's literally bending over and using his, you know, he's kind of pecking at himself. You know how ducks do that? Look at um, Adam with his ribs prominent. Of course, you know, Eve was made from the rib of Adam, right? So we'll see Adam's ribs, so they're very clear. And look at gorgeous Eve with that kind of undercutting of between her hair and her face and her body. Really, really, really gorgeous and nicely done. And these, of course, have to be visible from a distance, right? So he was also working to kind of make sure that people would understand what they were. And again, he's um, most likely trying to educate the literate parishioners. So they're literally um, illustrating scenes from the Bible in order to um, kind of educate parishioners who probably couldn't read the Bible themselves. And then look at God, every single, I mean, he's obviously the same person in every scene, but he's always doing something different. And I love how he's holding his robe so he doesn't trip on it. He's kind of got his robe and he's holding onto it. Sometimes it comes like this, sometimes it's like this. And he's standing on this little platform, which I think really helps give the figure volume. These are very volumetric figures. They're not just like, you know, dangling up in the sky or something, they have weight. and He's gone to the um, actual extreme in this case, because given the time period of showing the figure beneath the robe. So Adam and Eve, of course, are not wearing clothes. So of course there's a figure there, but look at the figure of God. You can actually see his hip here. You can see his arm here, here. You can see his shoulder, his leg actually is literally silhouetted sort of by, um, the drapery that hangs over it. That's something that you really see commonly in the Renaissance, which is several hundred years in the future. This wasn't, I, I was gonna call this a breakthrough. It's not even a breakthrough because nobody else was doing it. This guy was just ahead of his time, way ahead of his time, Niccolo. And he also was extremely well-read. We know that he used all sorts of sources, religious lay, etc. And he always would chisel in inscriptions. And each, each one of these bands right here has an inscription. And it's the Bible verse that he then goes ahead and illustrates down here. And there's an extra inscription on here. And it's right here. And you can see he's got his name on here, Nicolai. And if anybody on here, do we have a Latin teacher on the line? Because I'm going to put this in the chat because I've been trying to, um, I'm not sure if I can get this in the chat from my current screen. Hic exempla tri something about him bringing praise to Nicholas. 
Um, we can talk about that later if anybody wants to take on the translation of it. I actually had my nephew on the line trying to translate it properly, so we think that's what it means. All right, so here's the next step in the process here. So as my mother likes to say, Adam and Eve ate the apple. And you know what happens then, right? So here's Adam and Eve eating the apple. But again, these gorgeous volumetric figures and this wonderful tree with the snake, right? And the apple tree with the apples on it. But look exactly what's going on here. You can actually see the snake has an apple in its mouth and it hands it to Eve. Eve hands an apple to Adam behind the tree. Adam's got his arm come around by his hold. And then he takes another apple and he's eating it. This is, Adam's actually eating the dang apple right in front of your eyes. So you don't, we know what happens next and out they go. And look at that scene on the right. They are not happy. Like they know what's going, they know what they've done here. This is such an impressive work. I love the fact, you know, a, a, you know, all the parts are here, right? There's, um, you know, this angel is kind of armed angel with a sword, by the way, it's like, you're gone. They have their fig leaves, you know, they realize that they're new, they're covering themselves up with fig leaves and their feet are headed out the door and they're looking back like, you know, we have really screwed up. It is such an expressive work for such a kind of almost, you know, elemental kind of almost naive type of sculpture. It is really, really moving. So that is the beauty there of Niccolo. So imagine these on the inside of the church. There's another part of this church. I'm going to show you really briefly. This is the door. So I believe, we believe, scholars believe that when the facade was uh, redone in the year 1200, they also made the entry portal bigger. So the doors had to be, they needed bigger, like literally bigger pieces of wood for the door. And they had a lovely, wonderful, a uh, smaller cast bronze door, which they then had to kind of retrofit. And so they like, you know, pried everything up and rehammered them onto some new doors. So it looks like this. So bronze doors are a thing. And I think we'll do another talk on Verona and make some other Veronese recipes. And we'll talk more about these doors, but I wanted you to see them because they're just so charming. And just quickly point out, there's this great little guy on a donkey. We're about to see somebody else on a donkey. It just reminded me of him. This is actually an Old Testament prophet called, I think Balaam is his name. And then here's Sanzino fishing. Isn't that cute? Fun thing was out there with his fishing rod. So when you go into the church, here it is. If they repeat the um, red and white stripe motif, this is also quite similar to that church that we saw in Arezzo, the Pieve di Santa Maria, in that it has these kind of ponderous columns, the great archi a tutto testo. And then um, to get up to the altar level, you actually have to walk up steps to get onto the altar level. And as you approach, you can go down steps to go into the crypt. So in the crypt today, um, is in fact the the remains of the saint. You can go and venerate the um, body of San Zeno. And then up on the altar are two images of San Zeno. So you can see the great altar piece here, right here. And I'm gonna show it to you. Y'all may remember that we've seen this in here recently. This is the San Zeno altar piece painted by Andrea Mantegna in 1457 right before he moved to uh, Mantua to go into the service of the Gonzaga court as court painter. So remember, this was a key commission for him. San Zeno Maggiore in Verona was a big deal church. They were getting, you know, good artists to come in there and paint and they hired Mantegna and that kind of cemented his career and off he went to the Gonzaga. And he of course included in this uh, altarpiece um, San Zeno. So there's the Madonna and Child in the center of this gorgeous, Roman kind of atrium space with that the garlands going there through the middle. And then the first saint to the right of the Virgin, the Virgin's right here is San Zeno. And there you can see this beautiful dark skinned man with his nice long beard dressed up in his um, full on bishop outfit with his um, white gloves and the staff and his mitre. And then up here on the um, altar, there's another statue, another image of San Zeno, which is a statue. And here he is. And this was done in the 1200s. And so you can see this sculpture maybe wasn't on par with Niccolo. You know, the proportions are a little bit off. There's not really much body going on under the under the robes, but that's not the point. The, the name of the statue is San Zeno che Ride. It's the San Zeno who laughs. And look at him, he's smiling. Is that not the cutest thing? You don't see, works of art are rarely shown, you know, people are rarely depicted as smiling or laughing. And, never you know a saint on an altar they're just not shown like that so here he is you can just tell how much these people love San Zeno he's actually 
been sculpted with a smile on his face and he's been fishing and he caught something and there it is hanging right off there's this fish hanging off of his you know bishop um staff which may be a later addition but it's just is that the cutest thing in the whole world and he's like look i got one it's so cute so they just love him so let's step outside so remember the quartiere di san zeno the san zeno neighborhood right outside the church um if y'all remember from um the announcement I sent out yesterday. Yesterday was the 491st Venerdì Gnocco Lock. It would have been the day for the Bacchanal del Gnocco, the festival of the gnocchi. And it didn't happen yesterday because of COVID and they hopefully it will happen later. But the story goes that um, there's this tradition of handing out pantry items and food stuff to people on this last Friday of Carnivale. So in the United States, you know, we tend to celebrate Mardi Gras that Tuesday in, um, in uh, New Orleans, you know, be, and other cities um, before Lent starts. Well, in Verona, they celebrate the Friday before Lent starts and it's this Bacchanal of the Gnocco. So the story is that there was a period of famine and one of the wealthy people in town decided that he, he on his own expense was going to just hand out pantry items and so flour eggs and potatoes they already had potatoes potatoes had just come in this is the 1500s they had just been introduced um by um pizarro actually in um one of the spanish experts. so they made gnocchi and they've been making gnocchi on vayner de gnocolar ever since 500 years later we're eating gnocchi so we're making gnocchi tonight And here, so what they do is they process, everybody, you know, kind of gets, they have floats like we do in New Orleans or whatever, and they process from the Church of San Zeno, which you can see the big rose window back here, and they go all the way to the arena, and everybody just gets silly. And here's Papa del Gnocco with his fork with the thing on it, the gnocco on the end. Everybody's got their big fork with this gnocco on the end of it and funny hats, and they're just, you know, acting up and having fun. So my friend Nunzi, who's my friend who makes these lovely necklaces that I like to wear, turns out she's from Verona. So she was giving me all this information because I told her I was trying to figure out how to put together this Verona talk and I hadn't been up there in so long. So she starts telling me things and she told me all about the Festival del Gnocco and helped me out with some recipes even. And then she also reminded me that there is a saying and the saying goes, um, let's see, Veneziani gran signori, Padovani gran dottori, Veronesi tutti matti, Vicentini magnagati. So the deal is the Venetians are gentlemen People from Padua are super intelligent. There's this university there. People from Verona are crazy. You can see it. And people from Vicenza eat cats. I don't know what up with the cat eating in Vicenza. But anyway, um, you can see why they all think that the Veronese are just kind of crazy because they like to have a good time. And here they are just out there, everybody with their big humongous fork. I want one of those. I want the big like life size, you know, over life size fork with the gnocchi on the end of it. Hilarious. All right, so we're going to make gnocchi and then I'm going to, um, we're going to make two different toppings. But I'm going to make uh, one with truffles um, because I can, basically. So this is me with my truffle hunter buddy, Diego. And this was taken one fall. He's handing me a white truffle, that tuber magnatum pico. So that's kind of the most prized of all the truffles. Um, they're called tuber, but actually uh, truffles are an underground mushroom, a fungo ipogeo. And it's kind of a long discussion, and I think we'll have another, we'll, have, we'll actually have a dedicated truffle class, and we'll go in more into detail about how these things grow underground. Um, but just so you can see the kinds of truffles that are available around here. So that's Diego with one of his dogs called Pepe, who's just dug up this white truffle. Um, we also get these, um, it's called Uncinato, Tuber Uncinatum Chatin. I think those are more often found in Umbria. So if any of y'all have been um, down to Umbria, y'all may have, um, eaten those. And then tuber is Stephen Viet at the bottom, another kind of black truffle. This is the most common kind, I think. And they, we find those a lot around here between May and September. And in the winter, there are three or four different kinds of truffles that are found. Um, but there's one that's called the prized black truffle. It's the tuber Melano Sporum Viet. And they're very, very rare in this area. And for some reason, this year, there's a really good year for them. And so my truffle hunter buddy, Diego here, this is with his dog, Bianca. Um, because restaurants are closed, of course, he's always been trying to, he's trying to tempt me into truffles because he's got to sell them somewhere. So I get these pictures on my cell phone. It's like, look what I found, you know, and I'm like a sucker. So I'm like, I'll take it. So I got myself a tuber melano from beef. Here's how um, Diego hunts the truffles and then we'll go make some gnocchi. So you can see he has, his dogs obviously can smell the truffles 
from very far away. That's why he uses the dogs. The truffles grow anywhere from sort of this far underground to about this far underground. And so the dogs locate where they are and start to dig. And then the truffle hunter then comes in, he has this kind of a particular instrument. I don't know if you can really see it. It kind of has almost like a little sickle in a certain way. He um, continues to dig so that what he's trying to do is A, uh, not break the truffle when it comes up out of the ground and B, get to it before the dog does. Because the dogs are very well trained, but they want to eat the truffle. So the point is to let the dog find the truffle and then don't let them eat it. The dog gets a treat though. So if um, Diego un, uh, unearths the truffle like he did here, he'll give the dog a treat and he pets the dog and everybody's happy and the dog's, you know, flipping around everywhere. Everybody's thrilled. And then last step in the process, Diego replaces his divot. So that's the very important last step in the process is that you fill that hole back in because a truffle leaves spores like mushrooms do, but you need those spores to remain underground so you get more truffles next year. So it's very important that you close the hole back up before you leave and make your Gnocchi. So we're going to make, I'm going to make, show you how to make gnocchi, and then I'm going to top them with some truffles and fontina. And then I'm also going to show you how to do this with, I'm going to move over to the kitchen. I'm going to show you how to do it with gorgonzola and walnuts. Um, gnocchi are literally kind of like a, like a pasta in the sense that they're a first course. So, um, you can put anything on gnocchi. Whatever you can put on pasta, you can put on gnocchi. You can put red sauce, you can put pesto. Um, it's very um, versatile. So I'm gonna, so Lorenzo va bene. Si, 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 no tocar. Okay, gracias. All right, so I am going to make some gnocchi. They get boiled in water. They're like little potato dumplings. They get boiled in water just like pasta does. I'm gonna show you how to make them. Um, you need to use um, boiled potatoes. I've already boiled some potatoes. And you need a white potato that is um, kind of floury, like an Idaho potato. And that's not what I have, unfortunately. I have a very waxy potato, which is not really what you want. But um, I um, ordered some things from my vegetable guy and I told him I was making gnocchi. He goes, okay, I know exactly what you need. I'm like, okay, thanks. And this is what you brought me. So anyway, it's like you're ordering from the grocery time in time of COVID and you pretty much get what they send you. Um, and you know what? It works just fine. So what you want to do with it, it's basically just a, kind of a dough made out of um, potatoes already boiled with some flour and some egg. Um, the potatoes need to be reduced with a ricer. I don't have a ricer though. So I just use a fork. But so you want to be kind of, you want to try to get the potato to be in small pieces without overworking it. You know how when you like, if you like stir mashed potatoes too much, they get gummy. You have to be really careful about that. So we want to, these, these should be little white dumplings, fluffy as a pillow. You really don't want to overwork them. So I'm trying to reduce this just using a large fork to some consistency that looks as if it had been through a ricer. My granny usually say that it's better to don't use the very fresh potatoes. It's better oh, to really? have, yeah, it's better if you use some potatoes that you have in your kitchen in one week, for example, or two, before like the they make they the, things yeah, coming out of? a li little bit, yeah, <laughs> it's better. I did not know that. Had I known, I might've done that. Yeah, so I'm using, this is, like I said, these are, my potatoes aren't the best, but whatever, it still works. Um, it's, it's a little bit easier. It, it comes together a little bit better if you have a floury potato, like an Idaho potato, or maybe an old Idaho potato, like Lorenzo's grandmother says to do. So the key here is that these things are super versatile. I mean, it's literally potatoes. You can add some flavorings here. Um, I'm gonna use, I'm actually making this with two different toppings that actually have a lot of flavor. So I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna add a little bit of white pepper, which goes good with truffles as well as gorgonzola and some salt. It needs a good bit of salt because you know, it's just potatoes. Um, but you could also add some Parmesan cheese. Nutmeg is very common. And that's actually quite good with white truffles, but I don't have white truffles. I have prized black truffles. So I'm not gonna add the nutmeg, although that's um, an option. So there's sort of ways to make them flavorful. So I'm gonna add a good bit of salt. They really do need a good bit of salt. 
and then a little bit of white pepper. This kind of smells nutmeggy. So it does give it some kind of nice aroma. And then I'm going to start out with almost all, but not all of this flour. I might see if it, if it needs it all. This makes a little bit of a mess. If you're on a bigger table, it's really a lot easier than my little cutting board here. But that's okay, because y'all can't see what falls on the floor, I don't think. So you kind of make a well in the middle like you do when you're making pasta. And this is actually, I'm making, what I'm making here is a half of a uh, recipe. So I'm just gonna use one egg. If it's dry, I'll add another um, egg yolk, but I don't think it's gonna be dry. Elaine, mm -hmm. uh, what, what kind of flour you use? This is um, uh, heritage grain flour from my mill up the street. This is wheat flour. You can also use other kinds of flour. Um, I haven't actually tested that. I've read that you can do that, uh, but I haven't tested it out. But if you want to make them gluten free, you can do that. You're just basically trying to get, you know, the egg and flour just kind of serves to bind the um, all the potato together. So you can experiment with other types of flour. So potatoes, um, like I said, are a Colombian, post-Colombian vegetable that actually were not adopted uh, for food in Europe for quite a while. And I'm wondering about the Verona story because um, they might have been early, adap early adapters, early adopters. People actually thought that potatoes were poisonous and people, some of the, you know, sort of the ruling class had figured out that this was going to be a really good way to help end famine because potatoes were so uh, productive, potato plants were so productive and they're so filling and actually good for you. So um, it took a while, but it really did. In fact, the introduction of the potato from the new world into the old world actually solved kind of a problem, you know, centuries long problem of, you know, salmon for the populace. Um, of course, they unfortunately adopted monoculture um, by not planting diverse types of potatoes and that led to the potato famine in Ireland, which of course brought so many people to the United States. We have some um, questions uh, yeah. about uh, the use the, of uh, sweet potatoes. It's very, um, um, it's very strange for me because in, in, in Italy we don't use a lot of uh, uh, sweet potatoes we don't find sweet potatoes so we have only potatoes so uh, elaine is you can use sweet potatoes or not you can actually you can use some sweet potato and you can also use um like butternut squash even you can make a squash version but you usually would make sort of a squash puree and kind of mix that together with some potato um i think i'm trying to think if the texture i'm just thinking of the texture of a sweet potato once you boil it um it's a little bit mushier than this you might have to add some extra flour but you could still do it so this um works better if you let it sit for a bit and i the way i do this is you, you roll it you kind of make a um, long kind of a you kind of roll it out to make a log out of it relatively thin and if you let it sit just if you kind of just make a you kind of just make a dough and if you just let it sit like this for kind of five or ten minutes it kind of binds together a little better and then I put them in the freezer. I form them. I'm going to show you how to form them. They're a little bit chunky right now, but we'll do that anyway. So you form them individually, put them on a floured cookie sheet and put them in the freezer. And then you can just take them off the cookie sheet and put them in a sack. And then you can keep them in the freezer for you know as long as you want. And you can actually cook them frozen. And I kind of prefer to do that um, because they're kind of sticky and they get in the way. So I'm going to just make a kind of a log like that. And the way that they're formed, you just cut off little pieces that are kind of this big. And they're supposed to have little ridges on them. And so I'm going to put some flour here. 
you just kind of shape them into a nice oblong shape and then you roll them over a fork and kind of stick your finger in it. And so you end up with this little thing that has little ridges in it and a little kind of a, you know, indentation over there. And then put them on a very well floured surface. You can actually put them on a, um, Lorenzo si sente molto il um, keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> Um, or you listen to me. Allora, so then they just go onto here and you can kind of, once you fill this up, um, hang on, I'll make a few more. Um, then you can just put it in the freezer and then they, you know, they just, once they're hard little, hard little dumplings, you can, again, just take them off of the cookie sheet, put them in a sack, put them in a Ziploc. I don't have the patience to make these things really pretty. And so they're kind of lumpy, but they taste good. So I'm also not married to this idea of having the ridges on them because I find that once they cook, they're, they no longer have the ridges, so I usually skip that step. But don't tell don't tell don't tell Nunzi from Verona that I do that. I usually make a little pillow with an indentation in it. So this is what my gnocchi look like, and so this kind of helps them. Um, kind of little sauce goes down in there and stuff. So, and they're not tiny either because I get really bored, and so I just make big ones, and I don't worry about the ridges. So mine are not pretty, but they taste very good. So at this point, once you fill up your cookie sheet, you can put them in the freezer. And I'm gonna go get the ones out of the freezer that are sitting in there. And I'll be right back. One second. Diane, you have a question? I see you have, a... no? Okay. Okay, so here are gnocchi from the freezer. And again, you can just sort of literally, you know, put them in a sack just like that and they don't stick or anything. They just, they stay separated. Um, so I'm gonna, they kind of stick to the pan though, which is the reason for all the flour. Um, I'm going to make two different sauces here. And um, the first one is just literally um, melted gorgonzola. Hang on two seconds, I'm gonna wash my hands. And if you look this recipe up, it will tell you to use milk or cream and melt the cheese in there. And personally, I think that's overkill. And if you use the pasta cooking water, just like we do when we're making pasta, you get a great, excellent, creamy little sauce without having to eat all that cream and everything. So, I'm gonna just take a lump of gorgonzola and then melt it. And then as soon when these gnocchi are cooking, we'll see how I get some kind of starchy water. So you wanna use water from the gnocchi that have been boiling because they do the flour and the potatoes really starch into the water and that helps you make this nice creamy little sauce. So I'm gonna put some salt here. You wanna salt the water good because again, it's just, you know, the potatoes kind of need the help. And then let's see where my truffle is. Huh. Use your nose. <laughs> I know. All right, so I'm gonna throw these in. Let's get this up to boiling good. So these boil kind of like pasta. When they float, they're done. You want really good salted water. Nicely salted water boiling. It's not boiling yet. We'll let that come to a boil. Um, let me move that around a little bit. There it goes. So literally, they, as they cook, the um, 
egg sort of loses weight and they float. So I'm gonna let the cheese melt. I'm gonna let the gnocchi boil. When the gnocchi start to come to start coming to the surface, I'm gonna take a couple spoonfuls of water out of there because the water will have all of that nice um, starch from the flour and the potato. And I'm gonna mix that in here and you're gonna be amazed at the little sauce it makes. Uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna get my truffle out. So I bought um, a whole series of them. Look at that. Wow. How about that for a truffle? Is it that good? Here's the little baby one. So on the inside, like, it actually looks like that on the inside. It's just kind of amazing. You know, the other ones are so usually kind of white. It's kind of veined. I don't know if y'all can, can y'all see that? You can kind of see how it's veined, kind of dark purple, black and veined. It's got a very, very perfumey, very different kind of a aroma than the white truffles or any of the black truffles that we're more familiar with. So in order to, the one, I'm gonna do some in gorgonzola and I'm gonna do some in truffle. And the one I do in truffle, you could use butter. You need a little bit of fat that kind of helps the truffle aroma um, kind of spread around a little bit. I'm gonna use olive oil. I just prefer to be a little bit lighter, but truffles and butter are a classic. So I'm gonna use oil. I'm gonna use a little bit of Fontina cheese just to kind of give it a little extra something, even though it doesn't even necessarily need it. The truffle by itself is pretty good. So here's Fontina, which is a cow's milk cheese. It's pretty mild. Um, you don't, you would not use Swiss cheese. You could just use some other, I'm trying to think what other mild cow's milk cheese you could use, or just don't use anything. It doesn't, literally butter is plenty. So in this case, I'm just gonna kind of grate it in so that it um, will kind of melt quickly. Truffles don't usually get any heat either. Um, or white truffles don't in any event. Black truffles, you can cook a little bit. So I'm gonna actually do kind of do it both ways. I'm gonna put some in the pan with the gnocchi as soon as I put them in here, stir that around, and then I'm gonna put some on raw on the top. So here, let's see how this goes. So the first gnocco has floated. I'm getting just a little bit of water out of here. Again, starchy cooking water, always brilliant. And so that just mixes in with this melted cheese and makes this great little sauce, which the gnocchi are gonna kind of absorb. It's kind of the edge of that gorgonzola. And then I'm gonna to top the gorgonzola too, the gorgonzola gnocchi with some walnuts that I literally just toasted in a frying pan with some olive oil salt and I used a bay leaf just to give it some flavor. So here they are, I'm gonna just skim the ones that are floating. A little bit of you know cooking water on here is perfectly good. We like that. Mm. So here's a portion. Let's see what's going on here. So once you make these things, it's super quick. Again, you can put anything on here. Anything you can put on pasta, you can put on here. You know, the Italians usually call the pasta sauce a condimento. It's a condiment. Um, it doesn't need to be a sauce. It can be um, basically, you know, any kind of vegetable cooked with a little bit of garlic and olive oil, and then toss that through here, and you have like a kind of a nice little plate. Okay. Last one. Elaine, you can uh -huh. make uh, um, gluten-free uh, gnocchi. Yes, I've read that you can use other flours. I haven't tested that out though. So um, you might want to test that. I'm not sure what you would use. You might want to use something like even like oatmeal flour maybe. I'm going to use the same. Like rice flour, for example? I don't know if rice flour would do the trick here. Rice flour is, um, is so fine. I'm worried that it would make a very, um, I'm worried it would make a heavy, a heavy, you don't want it to be heavy. And I'm worried that, I, I would be worried that rice flour would make it, uh, make too heavy of a batter. I would use something that was a little, um, had kind of a different body to it. 
And I'm going to add a little bit of, here's my, so the thing about the truffle is you need a truffle slicer. Which you can, of course, buy online like everything else. Um, and I can, as I said um, in my announcements, I can hook y'all up with some truffles and would be happy to do that. I've also got a line on, Diego actually makes and is making his own, I'm going to plate these, um, truffle condiments, sauces and whatnot made out of truffles that are actually not so um, perishable. The truffle lasts for about 10 days before it's not good anymore. So, and then of course they're not in season all the time. This is a little sauce with white truffles, which would also be good on the gnocchi and he has some great truffle salt as well so this is just like big kind of nice salt with um little bits of black truffle in it my own personal favorite is the truffle honey um, i think some of y'all on the line i know have been um here with me and gone to visit diego and have gone home with truffle honey and um it is so good um especially it's just really truffle honey is just really good on you know, it's kind of on cheese, on a cheese platter kind of thing. So these are the gorgonzola gnocchi with some toasted um, walnuts on top. And it just kind of looks like white potatoes, but the gorgonzola has that, you know, used to gorgonzola dolce. So it's kind of that creamy, creamy, creamy blue cheese, super flavorful. And then let's do the truffle ones, which is so fun. This is just such a treat. Um, and I realize not everybody has a truffle hunter down the street. Um, but that's one of my favorite things about my neighborhood here is that I have a truffle hunter down the street. Um, so if y'all are interested in a truffle, let me know. We can work it out. So I'm going to put just a little bit more raw truffle on here because it's so good. And the heat just that little bit of heat. The reason these are sliced so thin is so that the heat from the dish that you eat them on just will release the perfume. Heavenly, heavenly flavor. And they're very, very kind of earthy. So they go really, really well, the truffles with the potatoes, because they kind of both have that, um, just kind of that earthy perfume. Yum. So happy Vayner de Nocolage. <laughs> uh, Luen, Luen, I, could you open your mic? she has a, a question for you i think she okay. speak about uh, nudie uh, because oh, she asked right. from uh, some gnocchi made it without potatoes but with uh, ricotta cheese those are nudie right but, and they mean they're, they're literally nude which means they're not clothed and what it is it's, it's the filling of a ravioli without the pasta on the outside and so they're called hmm. nudie so yeah so the family debate among the you know, the generation two, two above me, they would always debate what to call. It was a, a cavatelli. They called it cavatelli, which I know cavatelli is just a shape, yeah. but um, it would be ricotta, egg, and flour. Yes. Okay. Yeah. In Tuscany, they're called nudie. And where did, where's your family from that they would call them cavatelli? Uh, so it was really the Sicilian branch and the um, the Campobasso branch would have these debates. Interesting. So, yeah. I can't confirm or deny. Okay. We also, um, I've tried making it with gluten-free flour and it that, oh. that did work reasonably well. With the nudie? Yeah, Bill. Yes. Oh, good. Okay, good. I'm sure that would work here too then. So yeah, the nudie are light and fluffy as are the gnocchi. Super light, fluffy little pillows. So I did have one more question about the flour. Maybe I missed it. Do you know what, what kind of grind it was? Like whether it was a really fine grind you were using fine. today? Okay. Fine. I usually get number two because that's what comes out of my mill. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a relatively, it's fine and fine. You want a fine flour. You want a fine flour and um, you want to get your potatoes kind of fine. So my potatoes were chunky, but as you saw, it's pretty forgiving. It works anyway. So actually the, the kind of flour probably isn't, you know, just use what you have, literally. Luen, sorry, you, you say cavatelli? Well, I know that cavatelli is really a shape, but it was a debate yeah. that my relatives would like to have. Yeah, because normally cavatelli is a type is a kind of pasta made with right. uh, flour and water and sometimes eggs. Uh, right. And you find in Abruzzo, uh, between Abruzzo and, and Puglia, for example. That was so like, sense. Right. Yeah. 
is the is a little shape but uh, without uh, potatoes and without uh, ricotta only for topping or dressing for example but not mm -hmm. in the in the impasto in the dog and that's yeah. a beautiful bottle of um, Sagana in the background on your oh why thank you for noticing <laughs> that's Luann who I, I, I don't know if you were on the line or not but I actually typed Olio to go into the chat so people know where to get it so this is the Sagana olive oil Casalina blend 2020 on its way to a shop to an Olio to go store near you. Can't wait. Um, oh, I know, me neither. Oh, last thing, y'all usually ask me what wine I'm gonna have with this, and I'm a, I've already planned that out for you. So hang on a sec. I'm having one of my favorite wines, which I don't know, I found this, but I don't remember where I got it. But um, actually, I found it in Livorno, and it's called Artepe, and it's a Nebbiolo, and um, that's uh the same grape that's used for barolo and barbaresco which are actually plate locations this is from the valtellina so much north of there but it's still a barolo i mean excuse me the nebbiolo the barolo grape um and it's kind of a classic with truffles right it's, really, it's got some earthy aromas but also sort of it's got a very um distinctive aroma of uh, violets and it's beauteous beautiful Mm -hmm. and, don't, and don't they look good together? They look beautiful. <laughs> I wish we imported wine. <laughs> right. Anybody else have any questions? I find one very interesting question, but I don't find now, is uh, okay. about uh, is about the possibility to have the flower and the taste uh, uh, in the internet to send to <laughs> from your house to all over us. Oh, <laughs> but I think to send the gnocchi. Yeah, I have, get, yeah. I have to get Papa Del Gnocco to get on his donkey and bring it over there for y'all. <laughs> okay, still wish the internet came with the ability to smell the videos. <laughs> so it's, I know it's we should we should make a little scratch and sniff. We should do a scratch and sniff card. So I can actually y'all. I'll put in some information tomorrow if anyone's interested in truffles. Let me know. I can arrange some fresh truffle truffle shipment. It's not cheap. There are these are running at a thousand euro a kilogram which actually is not, you know, white truffles usually hover between five and 6,000 a kilogram. This is 1,000 a kilogram. And this um, was, this is actually about uh, 50, 60 grams. Um, so, you know, you, would, you don't buy that much. Um, so this would be, I think you have to buy either 80 or 120 grams, which is be sort of 120 euro plus shipping, of course. Anyway, I'll let y'all know that tomorrow. So it's doable if you're interested. And if you would prefer to have something less perishable and less um you know easier on the pocketbook we can also you know there's the little sauces made with the truffles and it's like pancini mushrooms and black truffles and the truffle salt truffle honey yum so y'all can still have the flavor um even if you don't have a truffle hunter in your backyard i think the last question i think the last question is from charmaine and neil and oh, they, they they say when can we come for dinner <laughs> so we hope that you should come very fast. They're in, in London. Yeah. Neil and Charmaine are in London. They actually could come for dinner. Yeah. Um, as soon as they let us free, y'all are invited. Come for dinner. <laughs> all of all of you are invited in Italy to come for dinner. Everybody is invited to come for dinner. As Elaine, soon as they set us free. Yes. This is from mom. Hey. Remind people to uh, let their friends know who might be interested in this that sometimes your emails for this uh, go to the junk folder, spam. Yeah, we've been having a trouble. We've been having trouble with that. I think a lot of y'all have had issues getting the recipes. Even people who get the announcements, a lot of times then don't get Me. the recipes. I send them to you, they get filtered out. Um, Lorenzo, do you have some way to fix this for us? Sorry? No, I have a problem that my email for the few or tante volte vanno a spam. No folder spam. No, I can't do that. But if y'all can check your spam folders, and then as my mother just said, maybe if y'all have friends who said, oh, I didn't know about this, you know, maybe they're on the list but didn't get a, um, a um, you You can check in your email browser uh, when you receive one email of uh, Elaine. You can check uh, that is not uh, a spam mail. Right. So the next right. one, they the, the, the software recognizes that it's not spam. Right. You didn't say thing. it's not spam. I think if they add me my if you add my email address to your address, yeah, book, it, it should it, it works. You still? Yeah. Okay. So that should that should then allow you. So actually, if you're if you're having trouble getting the recipes, 
um, you can on a Mac anyway, I'm not sure how it works on other computers, but for if you get the announcement, you can click on my email address and it will just say add to address book. You just hit that and then I'm added to your address book and then that means you will actually get the recipe. Although I don't mind forwarding them. Y'all can just write me and say, hey, I didn't get these. Um, but anybody who registered for a class is on the list for recipes. It's just that there are spam filters that, shift the, you know, stiff those things out, unfortunately. So you can try that, adding my name to your address. It does help. It does. Them. It helps. I've done it. I've done it. Oh, good. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So we yeah. Have proof. And yeah. I've done it for something else <laughs> here in San Francisco for something else I was having trouble with. And that's what I was told to do. So. Oh, good. Okay. So that works. Oh, so yeah. yeah. You might want to do that. Great. I get Are any other I questions? Know. Nope. No, nope. thank, you. thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Y'all are welcome. Thank Thanks you. for being here, everybody. It was great to see y'all. Yeah, tomorrow, we'll be in touch. Grazie mille. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Is that a question coming in? No. Alla prossima. Alla prossima. Hey, Jerry. Hey, Jerry. Bye, Jerry. Bye, y'all. Loved it. Loved it. Thank you. Grazie. Oh, Verona. Ciao. I like the blouse. Thanks. So do I. <laughs> Winter white. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Alla prossima. Alla prossima volta. <laughs>